welcome to the session of materials and application, the session three. Uh, the first speaker of today is Francisco Cano. Uh, thank you for your participation, Francisco, and you can uh, start, please. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, can I start now? Yes. Yep. Yeah? Okay, okay. One second, please. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Francisco Javier Gomez Cano, and I'm the presenter of this work, which is titled uh, Absorption, uh, Absorption of Dive by Charcoal and Activated Charcoal from Moringa Oleifera Leaves. And this is the list of research co-authors of this work. Uh, this is the general content of the presentation. Uh, okay. This is the general content of this presentation, and I will start with a brief introduction and motivations about the problematic. Then uh, I will continue with the fabrication process description. Uh, then uh, I will show you the results and, and some analysis, and, and finally uh, I will show you the conclusions. Uh, as an introduction and motivation, uh, we can say that the removal of dyes from water is a difficult task uh, since there is not currently single treatment or suitable process due to the complex uh, nature of this kind of substances. Uh, these dyes are widely used in different kinds of industries, like for example, textile, uh, paper and food, uh, among others, and large amounts are discarded into water bodies without previous uh, treatment. Uh, this leads to several serious problems. So many of these kind of compounds are also carcinogenic or mutagenic, representing a direct risk to human health when they are entered when they enter uh, the food chain or contaminant drinking water bodies. That is why it's necessary to develop new or suitable technologies to remove this kind of uh, pollutants uh, from, from water bodies. Uh, in response to these different technologies has emerged to offer a solution uh, to this problematic, like for example, gravity separation, ion exchange, sedimentation, ultrafiltration, uh, among others. However, Standard wastewater treatment technologies reach their limits due to the rapid population growth, large scale industrialization, and urbanization. In this context, uh, carbon based nanomaterials like uh, charcoal has emerged as a highly efficient alternative from water for water treatment. Um, charcoal is a lightweight black carbon rich material made from heating organic materials uh, in the absence of oxygen. Charcoal traditionally used uh, as an absorbent has demonstrated a remarkable ability in the absorption of a wide range of uh, dyes or, or different actually kind of contaminants. However, its high production cost and, environment, uh, and environmental concerns uh, associated with its synthesis require exploration of different alternatives and sustainable sources of, uh, is of uh, charcoal. That is why uh, Moringa, in this case, represents one interesting solution. This plant has a high lining and cellulose content, which favor uh, the formation of a porous structure uh, suitable for absorption. It is also renewable and low cost source, uh, widely uh, available in tropical and subtropical regions. Uh, making it a sustainable option for the production of carbon. So the first part of this investigation was the fabrication uh, of charcoal. This was obtained uh, throughout the pyrolysis process. Initially, the leaves were washed with water and dried for one week around. Subsequently, leaves were introduced into reactor with a constant nitrogen flow, where it was heated at uh, to 450 uh, Celsius degrees during one hour. Subsequently, the second part uh, was the activation of this material, I mean, the activation of uh, charcoal. 
Uh, the activation is a process by which the porosity in a specific surface area of the material is increased, which significantly um, increases its absorption capacity. Uh, the procedure for the activation uh, for this, uh, it was used a, a, a method or a methodology a collector method, which was discovered in 2010. This method uh, it's commonly used for the fabrication of graphene oxide. Graphene oxide is another a carbon based a nanomaterial. And during the procedure, uh, the fabricated, the previously uh, fabricated charcoal uh, by pyrolysis and potassium permanganate was used, which serve in this case as an oxidizing agent uh, that help us to introduce different kinds of uh, functional uh, groups into the material. Uh, both materials uh, were analyzed by FDR. The spectrum of the charcoal shows, in this case, the uh, uh, dark line. In this case, the spectrum of the charcoal shows significant peaks attributed to the oxygen and carbon, oxygen and oxy uh, oxygen and hydrogen stretching uh, bands of the hydroxyl groups present uh, in phenols and alcohols uh, species, following to the carbon and and hydrogen stretching vibrations uh, corresponding to aliphatic hydrocarbons. Additionally, we can find a, a peak that indicates the presence of carbon and oxygen stretching, uh, including a carboxyl, group, carboxyl uh, groups providing active uh, sites um, for the absorption uh, for similar compounds. Additionally, on other hands, in the spectrum corresponding to the activated uh, charcoal, in this case is the red line. Uh, in addition to the mentioned uh, previously bands, new bands are observed associated to carbon, uh, carbon oxygen stretching vibrations of the carboxylic groups, uh, following to the bands related to the bending uh, vibrations of the carboxyl and and. Carbox, uh, carbon and oxygen stretching corresponding to the alk alkoxy groups. So um, uh, the implication of alkoxy, epoxy, and carbonyl groups or among other functional groups indicate the presence of oxygen molecules that uh, occupies the H's and basal plane uh, uh, in, in this case in the material confirming its activation. Finally, uh, we can observe here uh, the shift of the carbon double carbon band after activation process is due to the interaction and influence of the functional groups introduced during the activation uh, process, as well as the resulting structural electronic change in, in the charcoal uh, network. While, on the other hand, uh, some images in the charcoal shows uh, in the first image it uh, shows a compact and amorphous surface with a small loose sheet attached to the surface. Then after the activation is the second image as we can see in the number in letter B. Uh, the morphology of this material change displaying a less compact uh, structure due to the chemical attack during the procedure uh, for the activation. And the resulting structure consists of, a, of an arrangement uh, of agglomerated sheets. sheets. So on the other hand, the morphological change were also reflected in, in the increase of the specific surface area, as we can observe here, uh, how there was an increase in this, in this parameter after the activation of the, of the material. Uh, additionally, to evaluate the efficiency on absorption process or in removal of different uh, uh, contaminants, we evaluate three different dyes. Uh, green, methyl, and blue, and rhodamine uh, uh, using both materials and then comparing the efficiency uh, of each one. Uh, the evaluation of removal of organic dyes uh, of both materials demonstrated important variations on absorption capacities uh, for the three different uh, dyes. Uh, for example, we can observe how the efficiency for rhodamine, it was around uh, 12%. Uh, while deficiency or the maximum removal or uh, the maximum absorption of methyl and blue in this case it was around 32 percent while the uh, deficiency of a uh, green it was uh, around 88 percent all of these uh, the parameters or the time uh, total time was in a, a 
the evaluation it was in a total time of 40 minutes. Uh, green showed uh, the highest absorption due to the, uh, its complex uh, molecular structure and strong electrostatic interactions uh, with the charcoal. In contrast, uh, the low absorption of rhodamine was related to the electrostatic repulsion due to the um, anionic nature of this, this dye. Additionally, green exhibits uh, the absorption and reabsorption behavior indicating different absorption mechanisms that are present uh, during the, the, the absorption of the dye. And then after activation of dyes demonstrated increased absorption with methyl and blue and rhodamine show it uh, the most significant improvement, uh, confirming that the activation introduced a uh, functional groups that improve uh, uh, dye charcoal uh, interaction, uh, improving in general the efficiency of absorption of this kind of dyes. And then the absorption of what kind of uh, nanostructures with every, every dye were fitted to a second order model to study the absorption kinetics. The absorption kinetics revealed uh, that the absorption rate is mainly controlled by chemisorption. In this case, that means that uh, chemical absorption involves the formation of new uh, chemical bonds between the surface of the nanomaterial and the different contaminants, or in this case, the different dyes that uh, I showed before. And using a diffusion model based on the movement of dyes within the surrounding media, we can describe the mechanisms of dyes absorption in several stages. Uh, the first step consists on the diffusion of dye molecules in the liquid film surrounding the absorbing nanostructures particles. This first step is called a film diffusion. Subsequently, the second step is the diffusion of this dyes inside of the particle uh, pores, and the second uh, step it's called intraparticle diffusion. And finally, the third step consists on the absorption of these uh, dyes or the molecules of these dyes uh, inside of the pores uh, of the material. And finally, uh, as a conclusion of this uh, short work, uh, we can say that the absorption performance uh, uh, there was variations in the absorption performance for the different uh, evaluated uh, diets. Uh, additionally, uh, these differences were attributed to the molecular structure of these dyes and their electrostatic interactions uh, with the surface of, of the absorbent. Uh, on the other hand, activated charcoal uh, demonstrated uh, important improvement in the absorption capacities for every, every diet. And this improvement was related to the introduction of oxygen containing functional groups during the activation, which generate new uh, active sites and alterate the surface, uh, the surface properties. And finally, the absorption kinetics reveal that chemisorption played a dominant role, uh, as demonstrated by uh, the pseudo second order model uh, that we fitted with uh, activated charcoal exhibiting longer equilibrium times. And that's all for the moment. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Francisco, for your interesting talk. And we have time for questions. Any questions? No? And then we start public. We have time for questions. I have a question. For example, in the methyl and blue, you say that the activate the charcoal is better in comparison with the charcoal. But in terms of cost and waste, what will be the best option in this case to use charcoal or activate charcoal? Uh, yeah, definitely in this case, uh, it's the best option to use, at least in this kind of uh, treatment, I mean, using the absorption process, uh, is the activated uh, form of this material. 
because uh, in a, an absorption process, it's really important uh, the surface of the material. And in this case, uh, the activated material has different functional groups that help us to interact with the molecules of the dyes in, in the surrounding media. And that is why uh, part of the conclusion that we can say that the best option to use in this case, at least with these uh, mechanisms, absorption, it's the finally the activated uh, charcoal. Okay. Uh, but in terms of cost, is not relevant in this case? Yeah, in this case, uh, it depends because, for example, the source of the original material, charcoal, uh, the source is uh, environmental friendly because uh, uh, it comes from uh, leaves or or actually it can use from different kind of sources. Uh, however, uh, it's important to say that uh, for now, for example, uh, the activation procedure or the procedure to activate the material, uh, it was using this methodology. However, uh, it's important to say that in the future, it's possible to develop new methodologies to activate this material, uh, trying to reduce the cost. Uh, uh, but it's a, a challenge uh, that it's necessary to, to develop new technologies in the future. Okay, very interesting. Um, do you know if are there are any other plans to obtain charcoal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, there are many kind of sources. Uh, it's possible to obtain this, this material from different uh, sources. Uh, there's not uh, we can say that there's not a, a limitation. Uh, almost uh, every fruit or every kind of plant can help us to obtain a variant of this material. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks again, Francisco. Sure, thanks to you. The next speaker is here? Uh, yes. Um, yes, I'm here. Ah, okay. Do you have some new ones? Yes, hello. Uh, <laughs> do you need just the USB? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is this? Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, this Okay. Thank Thanks so you. much. Thanks. Okay. okay, give me a moment, please. 
Yes. It's can we, can we start? Yes. Okay. I will. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Juan Jesus Rocha Cuervo. I am a six semester PhD student uh, in nanotechnology. I'm really happy to be here and thank you all for your for your time and for your presence. Uh, the topic of today will be the green synthesis of zinc oxide and tin oxide uh, analysis, a structural and morphological studies based on citrus extracts. Um, I hope uh, these results would be really interesting for you, as uh, and I hope the presentation you will be enjoying. Um, can you? Oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. okay, awesome. Yes, it is. And let me check. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah, no, no problem. Okay, this will be the table of contents that we are going to use for this presentation. As you can see, uh, we have the introduction. The introduction in this introduction, we're going to talk about well, uh, one of the most statement uh, problems that we studied to uh, get this investigation and these results. In the experimental procedure, we're going to talk about the methodology that we used to obtain uh, more of the uh, typical results and also the the equipment that we use for the characterization of the nanoparticles. In the results and discussion, we are going to talk about a little bit more uh, what observations we could uh, have done uh, later the, the characterizations. And finally, we have some conclusions and the references of the old, of the old um, work. Well, as the introduction, uh, actually, every year, around 10 million tons of uh, untreated hazardous chemicals are emitted from factories. And in here, the factories Almost always they don't have uh, a really a good administration of these uh, chemicals uh, residues, and they actually one of, of the more part of these residues as are uh, take apart to the environment. Actually, in terms of science and investigation in nanotechnology, uh, almost always the synthesis of the materials that we produce uh, has. Uh, something to, to, to do about with these uh, hazardous chemicals. And as you can see, part of, uh, well, almost always, uh, if they are uh, produced and then taken away into the environment, you can see how river canal features, uh, cultivation and plants, and actually the soil uh, have um, really good, uh, sorry, really bad effects about these hazardous chemicals. And actually, something that has been really explored until now is the green synthesis methodologies to try to maybe reduce the effects of the chemicals uh, from now. So in this sense, we are trying to study how uh, one methodology to produce two of the more studied nanotechnologies uh, materials that are zinc uh, oxide and tin dioxide which are actually with, widely used for different purposes, as gun sensors, for catalytic activity, and some other. Uh, these uh, applications are uh, really studied because of the, um, of the properties of these two materials. And actually, as I mentioned before, the conventional synthesis of this oxide often uh, involves hazardous chemicals, which pose environmental and health risks due to the use of toxic precursors. In this, in this sense, uh, the research uh, tries to look about how a green synthesis uh, of the use of orange and lemon peels as a reducing agents and stabilizing, stabilizing agents as a green synthesis could uh, uh, produce the, these nanoparticles, uh, highlighting the effects on the nanoparticle morphology, pro, uh, promoting sustainable production, offering insights of optimizing the green synthesis. But actually, something I would, I would like to highlight also is that uh, in this investigation, we produce this, uh, the same two semiconductor materials using both uh, orange and lemon as citric uh, liquids, okay, as the main um, as the main stabilizing and reductor agents. In this sense, let's talk about the experimental procedure, and I would like to also highlight something else about this slide. It's that, uh, as you can see, one of the our first step 
uh, was to obtain the peels from some orange and some lemon fruits. But uh, the dry uh, methodology that we use is actually non common in these kind of investigations. Because as you can see, for drying methodology, we use a really high temperature uh, around 200 degrees Celsius and a low, a really low uh, time. In this sense, if you compare this methodology, some of the methodologies that are produced in the church uh, tell us that you cannot use those higher uh, temper temperatures because uh, almost always the, me the metabolites that you want to use for the production of nanoparticles are going to, to be damaged more uh, about the high temperatures. In this sense, we are trying to uh, use this temperature and a really low time to see if the effect of the obtention would be uh, interesting or maybe not. After the, this temperature, we use um, a blend to, to use the dry pills to obtain a fine powder. Then the powder was uh, mixed with water to produce the orange and lemon extracts. After that, the orange and lemon extracts were used as the main uh, solvent to mix it with the precursor salts of a uh, zinc, of tin, and actually, after some mixing, as after uh, a water bath of uh, 1600 degrees Celsius, sorry, 60 degrees Celsius, and as um, some um, centrifuge uh, methodology, we heated the final, we separated the powders, we heated uh, at uh, 100, 400 degrees Celsius to obtain four, uh, in this sense, four uh, main powders. Zinc, produced with orange and lemon, and tin oxide produced with orange and lemon also. Okay? This is the main uh, technical of characterization that we, per, that we use for the after the green synthesis. As you can see, we divide it in three parts. The spectroscopy characterizations, mainly uh, done by FTIR, XRD, and Raman spectroscopy. We use DLS to measure the distribution characterization of the nanoparticles. And finally, we also use SIM with EDS, to measure the morphological characterization of the nanoparticles, to also compare the distribution obtained by DLS, and also to see the elemental mapping and the elemental composition of the final um, of the final nanoparticles. Okay, let's get into the first results. Here we are just analyzing the differences with that we, as I mentioned before, uh, what could be the final effect of the high temperature methodology that we use to. Uh, to dry the peel of the citrus. In this sense, uh, let's start with the down part of the image. We can see here actually that the lemon and orange powders shown their characteristic and functional compounds that are that were sorry that were analyzed and compared with the literature. We found that everything is okay in terms of the um, in the presence of the key bioactive compounds. And actually, something that I would like to highlight also is that. Uh, in comparison between the powder of lemon and the powder of orange, lemon has uh, e an increased uh, level of key bioactive compounds. Just if you can see the signals that, the, that we could um, found, lemon in comparison with orange, lemon has a lot of compounds uh, in comparison. After that, um, after emphasizing these, these uh, signal differences, we obtain the similar spectra between the powders and the and the liquids which is actually a really good uh, news because this confirmed the preservation of bioactive compounds after the methodology of high temperature treatment in this sense as a quick conclusion we can say that the bioactive agents uh, found show the, uh, sta the stabilizing and reducing capacities of these uh, liquids for the green synthesis of nanoparticles so uh, then we use the liquids, we produce the, the nanomaterials, and in here you can see that in the upper part of the image we have uh, the zinc oxide produced with orange, zinc oxide produced with lemon, tin dioxide produced with orange, tin dioxide produced with lemon. Okay, in this sense we use the same uh, spectroscopy just to obtain and analyze if we could uh, uh, get the the bands, the characteristic bands of every semiconductor. And actually, here we highlight that uh, for every of uh, for every sample, uh, in terms of zinc oxide, he, we could found the um, the bands between these signals. 
confirming the successful synthesis. And also, we could uh, find the these signals that confirm also the successful synthesis of octane dioxide. I would like to highlight in this synthesis that, as you can see, just zinc oxide and uh, nanoparticles and were found some other signals that are in relationship with the phenol pyrolysis and the surface hydroxy groups because of the content of the of the um, the compounds after the treatment that we produce to, uh, to obtain the nanoparticles. Okay, so. Actually, these uh, pyrolysis um, signals of the organic compounds were not found in the tin dioxide. So, in this sense, we get another conclusion. Actually, it could be possible that in the synthesis of tin dioxide, the process likely removes uh, organic uh, residues in this uh, semiconductor, uh, maybe do its higher thermal stability of the semiconductor in comparison with the higher stability of zinc oxide. Then. Um, talking about the XRD results, actually, we use this characterization to confirm the size uh, crystalline phases in the semiconductors. And as a quick conclusion and result, we can we can say that the we could obtain the crystallinity of both of the semiconductors. But actually, this was really interesting also because if you compare the signals of zinc oxide uh, obtained by orange and the zinc oxide obtained with lemon, we can see that just the zinc oxide obtained with lemon could obtain the hexagonal structure that is always or, or almost always in the literature uh, uh, wanted and is almost always obtained in this sense. Um, just with the lemon extract, we could, uh, we could obtain the um, the crystalline external structure of, of zinc oxide. And actually, in comparison with zinc oxide, the tin dioxide, in, independently of the type of liquid extract we use, we could obtain the typical signals of the uh, tetragonal and ructal uh, structure of the tin dioxide. In this sense, another type of conclusion is that these, find, these findings suggest that the methodology could be optimized to obtain and uh, maybe for some other semiconductors or maybe for for this um we could change a little bit the methodology to obtain independently of the type of liquid uh, citric liquid we use uh, the, the structural uh, the, the crystallinity desire in this sense and also i would like to to ask you uh, the favor of just not forget the, um, this signal the signal of the zinc the zinc oxide with orange because it could be uh, important in some few uh, slides. So, in this, in Raman spectra, actually, as you can see, uh, unfortunately, there were not uh, the typical vibrational modes uh, that are always, uh, that almost always appear in the method, in this type of results, on these type of methodologies. Uh, the signals were absent, and we could also find as a conclusion that maybe due to, due to a structural defects, or maybe about because of small particles uh, that we obtain uh, during the synthesis, this could, this, uh, could cause a quantum confinement effect or second, or maybe just the particles were covered on the surface by, um, as, as the results mentioned in FTIR, maybe the, uh, the particles could be covered for some other uh, residues of the, of the organic compounds that could um, avoid that this characterization uh, shown us the typical signals. And actually, if you can see, just one sample could obtain one signal expected in the Roman mode that could be, uh, and that's, um, sorry, the, this sample was the zinc, uh, the, sorry, the tin oxide with lemon extract. In this sense, also, as, as the same conclusion in obtaining XRD, these results tell us that there is a need for an improvement, purification, and optimization of the synthesis to get these uh, signals um, made in the future. Now, in this sense, we also uh, have done the DLS analysis to check out the particle size distribution between all the, part all the particles. Like we can see that in the zinc oxide, we uh, obtain similar sizes distributions independently also in the type of um, of uh, liquid use, we can see that an average in, in sizes were uh, 300 sizes for zinc oxides. And in this sense, 
the interesting results were when we obtained uh, the comparison between tin oxide uh, with lemon and orange. In the case of orange, an average size uh, really um, re-established was an average size of 200 nanometers in sizes. But when you use the tin dioxide with lemon, you can see two different size distributions. One that is uh, really above uh, 100 nanometers, and the other one was uh, sir, um, really close to 600 nanometers. In this sense, it was really interesting how if you change the uh, the citric um, yeah the citric uh, liquid, uh, look how the size distribution changes a lot in terms of every semiconductor. Okay, so in this sense, if you are looking for a specific size and you are using maybe in the future semiconductor as zinc oxide and you're producing the green synthesis, uh, you can see that uh, the citric extract does not produce any changes. Um, in terms of zinc oxide, but in the case of thin dioxide, maybe you need to, to look up uh, the specific size you want to you want to try and the specific liquid, a citric liquid you want to, to try also in the methodology. Okay, thank you. Well, um, for the same images, let me do it really quickly. For the zinc oxide in orange, we uh, we could see a glomerular flake-like structures, and actually for the lemon, we could uh, produce it, we could see also. Uh, as I mentioned before, here the differences between orange and lemon was that uh, lemon has a really uh, specific type of flake that turns out to be uh, almost crystalline, as the XRD results uh, show us. And in the case of uh, tin dioxide, you can see that we could obtain a different morphology uh, that was not randomized. In this case, it was uh, like a rope like structure. And when you use the tin, uh, the tin dioxide with lemon, the structure was yeah uh, was more compact. We could see a granular surface with particles between 30 and, and almost uh, 200 incisors. And finally, of the conclusions, we could prove four points. The high temperatures of the dry methodology could be proved to be efficient for the reactive compounds. A second conclusion, we demonstrate the effectiveness of the citric liquids to synthesize these semiconductors. As here, you can see that between orange and lemon extracts, uh, you can get be, uh, from a smaller thin or zinc oxide nanoparticles to larger thin and zinc oxide uh, nanoparticles and uh, that could be used for different applications depending on the type of uh, sizes or morphologies you are looking for. And finally, the findings emphasize the potential of green synthesis to reduce the the typical chemical contamination we are, avoid, we are facing right now for nanoparticle production. And these are the references for the presentations, uh, this presentation, sorry, and thank you for your attention. Did you estimate crystallite size of the differential spectrum? Uh, no, we have not uh, measured the crystalline the crystalline size. Actually, um, what we face in the results in terms of that one uh, some citric extracts produces one or another crystallinity depending on the semiconductor. Um, Something I would try before measuring the crystalline uh, size would be to obtain a specific uh, preferential structure and then measure it if it could be possible in the future. But we have not uh, measured it with these results. Mm -hmm. How difficult is to the scalability of this kind of process? Okay, this quality could could be maybe a really um, could be really could be could be a scal a scalable with a high probability. I in, I mean, uh, we use a methodology that could be um, done in any other part of in any other laboratory. Maybe in in other parts of the world, the the that could be changed could be the fruits. And I'm really sure that um, the fruits in terms of, bio, of uh, the biological compounds, you can compare that it would be the same almost always. 
So I, I would say that it could be highly uh, scalable and easy, easy to do. Easy to do. Yeah, yeah, highly scalable and easy, yes. Thanks again. Oh, thanks. Okay, The next speaker is Israel Ivan Lara. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Is this your <laughs> Yes, this one. This is a pointer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Israel Lara, and I will talk to you about the prototypality of the variety of Nibonari yesterday by spray seed outside the films. Uh, here I'll share with you an outline of the topics that I will uh, talk to you about. Uh, well, first of all, what is Nibonari Well, Nibonari yesterday is an endocrine disruptive chemical widely used in oral contraceptives to inhibit ovulation and endometrial development. Once the oral contraceptive is ingested about uh, 23% is metabolized. Nevertheless, the rest is squirted via urine and uh, deactivated. Unfortunately, about 99% of this uh, chemical could be uh, reactivated uh, in wastewater and also um, microorganisms that are present in the sewer pipes and end up in aquatic environments. The presence of these pollutants in aquatic environments negatively affects aquatic species. For example, with concentrations above 0.8 nanograms per liter, causing the fat head menu, decreasing the number of exposition, aggressiveness, changes of breeding behavior, and the masculinization of sec secondary sex characteristics. On the other hand, uh, humans exposed to high concentrations could cause man to become a spermic, a prostate, testicular, breast, and ovarian cancer. Uh, to, address this environmental, to address this environmental threat, the photocatalysis efforts are promising and a very an environmentally friendly solution. This advanced oxidation process is based on the irradiation of a semiconductor, and when a photon reaches the semiconductor with the required amount of energy, um, the electron in the conduction band reacts with a... Uh, mm, 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 it causes an electron to move from the valence band to the conduction band. The electron in the conduction band reacts with oxygen, uh, with oxygen producing superoxide anions, while the hole produced in the valence band reacts with water forming hydroxyl radicals. Both superoxide anions uh, can degrade pollutants into water and, dioxide, and carbon dioxide. One of the metals that is commonly reported uh, by several authors is zinc oxide, since it has a high photocatalytic performance under UVC light, and it's also uh, present for subtle morphologies and modifiable crystalline structure. Okay, for this project, two things film uh, of zinc oxide were synthesized. The first film uh, was prepared using a 0 0.1 molar uh, concentration of the zinc precursor, uh, which has uh, Mixed with methanol, glacial acetic acid, and water with three percent atomic uh, with three atomic percentage of nickel acetate added to obtain a zinc oxide film dub with nickel. This sample is referred as zinc oxide 0 0.1 SP uh, nickel. The second film was prepared using a 0 0.2 uh, mole uh, of the zinc precursor. Uh, and it was, the precursor was ground for one hour at six uh, revolutions per minute and dissolved in methanol, glacial acetic acid, and water. This sample is referred to as zinc oxide 0 0.2 SP GIAP. Okay, uh, well, uh, both, sorry, both films were deposited via ultrasonic spray pyrolysis at 450 degrees Celsius for six minutes. And well, a nitrogen was used as a, a carrier gas. And the fields were, that were obtained were used without um, any modifications, both for the, uh, the photocatalysis experiments and the characterization. And the calibration cure for Libanon yesterday was prepared grinding a 
commercial the unregistered pit. And um, the maximum observance was recorded at 245 nanometers for both the calibration curve and the photocatalysis and photolysis experiments. For the photocatalysis experiment, a three part per million unregistered resolution was irradiated with a 60 watt 254 nanometers uh, UVC lamp for 120 minutes. The distance between the sample and the lamp was maintained at 4 centimeters and the observance was monitored every 30 minutes. It's worth mentioning that before UVC light irradiation, the solutions containing the photocatalysis were kept in the dark for 30 minutes to allow for the stabilization of levonorgestrel absorption of the thin film surface. Uh, for comparison purposes, the photolysis was also performed and the corresponding absorbance spectra was recorded. Here we can see the FTIR characterization, and we can see from 450 to 650 uh, uh, bands that correspond to zinc oxide extraction vibrational modes. Additionally, we can see for the uh, DOP sample uh, a band that corresponds to uh, nickel and oxygen stretching vibrational mode. For the extra characterization, we can see that uh, uh, peaks corresponding to 002 and 103 uh, of pure hexagonal woodsides and a, point, a peak corresponding to 004 of same blend. Mm, no, no peaks were found uh, for the dope sample related to the to, to nickel, which could be attributable to the low uh, to the low presence of the nickel, or that maybe that the mm, resolution of the equipment is not enough for for the for the nickel to be observable. Uh, it is also noticeable that looping with nickel changes the preferential orientation of the film from 002 to 004, indicating a different growth process due to the dopant. This resulted in a smaller crystallite sizes and different morphology. And the, well, the crystallite size and the dislocation were computed for both samples. And the smaller crystallite size in the dope single size sample is attributed to the impurity effect of nickel, which causes higher nucleation density at the initial stages of crystal formation, leading to smaller crystallites. Additionally, the, the lower molarity of the zinc precursor also contributes to the smaller size, shape, and structure of the zinc oxide samples. Let's keep in mind also that the process of crystal nucleation starts by the creation of molecular proton aggregates in the solution or liquid phase that go through a second process known as crystal development. These process form macroscopic crystals according to the literature. The smaller crystallite sizes are produced with nucleations of pure rapidly. This suggests that nucleation happens faster in the adult sample than in the pure sample. Uh, well, uh, based on this result, it is expected that the adult sample uh, should have a better photocatalytic performance. First, due to its smaller crystalline size, but also to its higher dislocation density that offers a more active size for the photocatalysis. And then for the same analysis, we can see that, uh, first of all, we obtain agglomerated hexagonal flakes with an average particle of 229.8 nanometers. Uh, that for the dope sample, and for the pure sample, we obtain agglomerated particles with irregular shapes and an average particle size of 305.3 nanometers. Uh, the formation of smaller particles in the dope sample is attributable to the presence of nickel as a dome part, as the smaller concentration of the precursor, which is likely to cause the formation of a smaller amount of material. On the other hand, the presence of bigger particles in the pure sample is attributable to the higher concentration of the precursor, which contributes to the deposition of a higher amount of material. Additionally, the myelin process could also cause the production of bigger uh, particles, since the impact of friction and compression between the random ball and the precursor generates smaller particles that tend to agglomerate due to Van der Waals force. Uh, it is also noticeable that the pure zinc oxide sample shows a more ordered structure, while the zinc oxide sample presents structures randomly oriented. 
Additionally, the dot zinc oxide seems to be more porous than the pure material, which should increase the photocatalytic performance of the material due to a higher interaction between the photocatalyst and ion of yester. Uh, here we can observe the percentage degradation of Nibonar yesterday during photolysis and photocatalysis experiments, as well as the absorption behavior of the sample. The lowest degradation percentage was obtained with the pure zinc oxide sample, while the highest degradation percentage was, was obtained with the dope sample, which is 81.3. Nevertheless, it's interesting to notice that the photolysis obtained the same degradation percentage as the dope sample. Okay. The higher photocatalytic performance of the dope sample is attributable to its higher porosity, a smaller crystal size, and higher dislocation density. On the other hand, the lower photocatalytic result corresponds to the pure sample, which is likely due to the lack of defects on the surface of the material, which was caused by the myelin of the precursor and the presence of bigger crystalline and particle size caused by the higher concentration of the precursor. Also, the degradation of limonary yester by photolysis matches the performance of the zinc oxide sample. Complete degradation is not possible through photolysis alone. And authors believe that it may be viable by photocatalysis using the zinc oxide thin film synthesized by the authors with longer irradiation times or by using a different photocatalytic material. This work represents the first step for testing the photocatalysis of limonary yester using zinc oxide, and an additional work is required by the authors to improve the photocatalytic degradation of the of yesterday and understand also its degradation mechanism. So in conclusions, pure and doped, uh, pure and doped zinc oxide zinc films were successfully synthesized using ultrasonic spray analysis and evaluated for their effectiveness in degrading the one of yesterday. The study examined the effects of different deposition conditions, including precursor concentration, mining, and doping. The results show that higher precursor concentration led to larger crystallite and particle sizes, while mining reduced surface defects and promoted particle agglomeration. Additionally, doping the samples resulted in smaller crystallite sizes to an accelerated nucleation process. The photocatalytic experiments revealed that surface defects, crystallite, and particle sizes, as well as the location density, are critical factors influencing the photocatalytic activity of the materials. The dog zinc oxide sample demonstrated superior photocatalytic performance compared to the pure sample. However, uh, we can see that photolysis achieved a degradation percentage equivalent to the dog zinc oxide sample. Uh, consequently, uh, what further investigations are required to enhance the photocatalytic degradation of Ligon or by adjusting various deposition parameters, such as the deposition technique or maybe the materials that were used. <laughs> Additionally, it is essential. It is essential to gain a deeper understanding of the degradation mechanisms as, uh, associated with the polar. And well, that is all for me. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jorge. Yes. I want to mention the fact that in professional literature, it is amazing to encounter that there is only one publication, only one publication regarding a uh, photocatalytic degradation. Uh, this made me suspect that, as you point in, in, the, in the introduction, uh, there is the chance to develop a more dangerous uh, secondary uh, products uh, that in this work, very interesting, it, it will be necessary to do in order to follow the, 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 uh, the degradation uh, uh, in chemical composition. Uh -huh. uh, my, my other suspect is if a uh, registry uh, was uh, prohibited for further uh, application as anticonceptive pill. No? Uh, uh, there, there is a lot of, of questions no? to, to yeah. uh, but uh, in, in the first term, to say that it's uh, not usual uh, report 
degradation by photocatalysis process. Okay. Yes. Well, uh, regarding the, your comments, yeah, the, uh, actually, I think that even though yesterday is not gaining like a lot of attention, uh, that's what it seems to me. And I found some papers uh, regarding the degradation of lymphonodiestrol, but not a uh, photocatalytic, but about uh, the degradation of lymphonodiestrol in soil uh, with also the presence of foils. But uh, I mean, it, it may be interesting, but it will be also interesting to make more research uh, related to the degradation of lymphonodiestrol with photocatalysis and then compare if the process is similar or the same. But yeah, thank you so much for your comments. Do you know what are the products for me? Uh, I, uh, with the photocatalytic process, no, unfortunately, there are not uh, enough literature, but in the future, uh, authors are considering uh, also making investigation about the, the soup, uh, Products from the the photocatalytic degradation. And what do you think to do to enhance the photocatalytic degradation in your work? Well, what we are planning, one of the things is changing uh, the material, uh, increasing the ir irradiation time, but also uh, what with the uh, sample of say. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The idea is also to use the the same deposition method, but also um, maybe uh, not grind the material, maybe dope it, or maybe use other dope packs, maybe as oxide graphene, or maybe a combination of uh, oxide graphene and silver, or, or only silver, just to test if that is uh, that improves the performance. Of the photocatalysis. Uh, yeah, there is a lot, there's a lot of work, but I was yeah. pretty excited of doing all this. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks again, uh, Israel. We don't have more questions. Thank you. Okay. Give me another one. I have your slide here. This is your slide. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay, doctor. Give me a moment. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Robin Reyes Vallejo. I'm going to present uh, this uh, short work that we are uh, doing uh, using waste. Uh, also, following the, the previous points, uh, uh, I am working on water treatment. Uh, but my main uh, focus is on develop a material using waste. Uh, this is the context of my presentation. And anyway, well, uh, following the previous presentation, I am interested in water treatment. In the case of the uh, textile industry, not only uh, water discharges are uh, considered, uh, this industry uh, prom produces a lot of uh, carbon dioxide. And in the case of uh, the, the dischargers, uh, for example, for uh, only doing a pair of uh, jeans, a great amount of water is used and not only in the textile industry is used the, the dyes. For example, in the case of Mexico, methylene blue, methyl, uh, blue and malchite green is used in aquaculture, uh, paper and leather. And in some cases, because of the antioxidant activity of these uh, dyes, it is used in medical and biological purposes. Uh, in the case of Mexico, we have a very, uh, several uh, issues, several problems. In the case of in the north of Mexico, according to Conagua, we have a uh, stress of uh, water, mainly as mainly in Monterrey. I don't know if you have uh, observed uh, news about this in the in the last year. Also in Tijuana, we have uh, problems with with this uh, aspect. Uh, but in the case of the center of, of Mexico, we have a very drastic uh, problem. 
uh, Conagua has uh, described uh, seven uh, basins uh, close to the to the center. If you, if you see, all of them are close in Michoacán, Ciudad de México, Hidalgo, Jalisco. So we have uh, a huge problem that, that we have to, to attack. Uh, this, uh, this is concentrated near to the industry. Uh, for example, we have a, a lot of heavy, heavy metals, uh, nutrients like phosphate, nitrates, uh, a lot of uh, organic compounds, which are uh, persistent organic compounds, uh, pat pathogenic uh, micro microorganisms, for example, E. coli. So it's a problem that we have attacked attack in a multidisciplinary multi way. Uh, for example, uh, I am going to talk about absorption, but there is a, a lot of methods, for example, like previous uh, has exposed, uh, photocatalysis, uh, electrochemical methods. So we don't have to to get uh, married with only one technology. No? We, we have to, to develop several technologies and to abort the material according to, to, the, to the problem. In the case of absorption process, uh, these are the, the advantage. The, the issue of this method is that we have the, the powder, we introduce it in the solution, and we um, based on the interaction of the pollutant and the surface of the material, it gets ad absorbed to the, to the surface, so we can recover after, after the, uh, the time with the material. But also we have a, bro a problem. Uh, the, the pollutant is only moved from the solution to the surface of the of the material. So the, the, we have the, the pollutant uh, in, uh, still. For example, in the case of photocatalysis, we eliminate it uh, because we, we produce the chemical uh, reaction. In this case, we, we need to do something else. For example, uh, a waste disposal. Or for example, we can use uh, electrochemical methods for decompose the, or if the material is organic in the surface, we can decompose it uh, uh, using potential or, or voltage. Or in some cases, if, if we absorb metals, we can uh, rec recover the metals by, by applying some uh, voltage or, or potential uh, as a similar way in an electron deposition process. So this is, this process is uh, very friendly with, with natural because uh, we can develop uh, materials with uh, waste, for example, uh, as Francisco said in the first uh, presentation, we can use uh, different ways of fruits, vegetables, uh, plants, trees, so the cost is, is, is very low if we use uh, these kind of, of materials. In my case, I, I am uh, interested in abundant waste, for example, eggshells. Uh, eggshell is a uh, worldwide uh, used uh, food. Uh, well, there. Uh, in the case of Mexico, we are not uh, in the top of the production of egg, but we have enough uh, production to to have great amount of eggshell. Uh, uh, the main production is uh, uh, happening in Jalisco, and in the case of, of this material, is rich in calcium, uh, mainly in in the form of carbonate but also it has a small content of magnesium, which is also another adsorbent. In the case of calcium carbonate, it's by itself uh, adsorbent, but if we uh, anneal in uh, above 500 degrees, we can obtain calcium oxide, which is uh, an excellent uh, and better uh, adsorbent, but also presents photocatalytic properties. If we produce water in this uh, calcium oxide, we can obtain uh, calcium hydroxide, which is uh, adsorbent, and also, if we introduce uh, phosphoric acid in this uh, calcium hydroxide, we can de develop, for example, uh, phos uh, calcium phosphate or hydroxyapatite. Hydroxyapatite is the material that we have in the in the tip, uh, which is an, an, another excellent adsorbent. Actually, the cafe uh, uh, paints the, the tip because of the presence of this uh, this material. Uh, well. This is a, a biodegra biodegradable mat material. Actually, I don't know if you have learned or have heard about the uh, uh, governmental program uh, called uh, the Sembrando Vida. For example, in Sembrando Vida, uh, they uh, produce a, a fertilizer uh, using the, the eggshell, mixing with the, the uh, another, another sticks of the cows, for example. So, 
This uh, eggshell has a great potential, but also we can uh, mix it with an, another materials, for example, uh, metal oxides, enhancing the photocatalytic properties of uh, with another adsorbent, enhancing the adsorption properties. Uh, the other material that I am interested in is in the orange peel. The orange peel can be used direct or indirect, as the previous presenter uh, said. Uh, in my case, uh, uh, I use uh, the, the extract using water or using water with uh, ethylene glycol. Uh, this uh, waste has uh, different phytochemicals, uh, organic acid, flavonoids, oils, pectins, and tannins. Uh, as a first hypothesis, uh, we propose this uh, waste or this extract uh, because it has uh, these uh, phytochemicals. So we, uh, we were interested in removing all the uh, complexing agents to form ternary oxides. For example, bismuth vanadate, uh, ferrites, bismuth titanates. So for, in a regular or a conventional process, we use uh, setup or SDS or different uh, auxiliary agents to, to promote the formation of ternary oxides. In my case, I, I use this uh, material because of the phytochemicals, but also because of the organic material, it has a lot of cellulose content. So at, at, the, at the end, it works as a fuel, uh, simulating the presence of urea. Urea is the common material used to promote a reaction on, on the combustion method. Uh, but also an, an important aspect that we have at, uh, using this kind of, of materials is that we can uh, functionalize the, the material, as says, uh, say the previous uh, opponent, uh, we can leave some uh, functional groups in the surface of the or of the uh, metal oxides, uh, giving an extra function to, to the to the material. For example, we can leave carbon inside of the structure, uh, promoting the defects in the in the materials, enhancing the electrical properties. So. We can uh, obtain or de develop materials with a better photocatalytic properties or enhancing the, the absorption of the dyes or the pollutants. So we can uh, increase the, the, the removal also by, by the absorption and by the photocatalysis process. Well, this is the, the process is very simple. In the case of eggshell, we only wash it, uh, blend it, and uh, sieve it in order to homogenize the, the, the size of the, of, the, of the particle. At the end, we anneal at 900 uh, Celsius degrees for five hours to promote the formation of calcium oxide. On the other side, we are forming a zinc ferrite. Uh, we obtain the peel, orange peel powder. We introduce it in water. We macerate it uh, two hours at this temperature. At the end, we cool down naturally, and we uh, mix in water uh, zinc and iron nitrates in a equi molecular proportion. And then we mix, mix to the solution, and we uh, heat it uh, around 80 Celsius degrees to 90. And to we remove all the water. At, at the end, we have a mix of these two sources and the orange peel powder. We move it to the furnace and we heat it to 500 Celsius degrees and we finally form the, the ternary oxide. We mix it in a conventional ball milling process. And finally, we introduce ethanol uh, to increase the incorporation of feed material. But also an, an important aspect is that at the end of the milling process, we have a material which is very compact. When we introduce the ethanol in the in the in this mixture, uh, we observe a change in the morphology or the appearance of the of the, of the material. Actually, we have like a talcous appearance, a very soft material. And finally, we anneal the material in order uh, to recover the formation of the calcium oxide because we, when we introduce ethanol, it reacts with calcium oxide forming calcium hydroxide. Uh, well, these are the, the results. Uh, we are using 80% 80, 80 of calcium oxide and 20% of zinc ferrite. As, as you can see, the main peak is of calcium oxide. And we have some uh, very small peaks in, in blue. 
which is which are associated to the presence of calcium, calcium hydroxide. We don't have problems with the presence of this material because it has a very good uh, adsorbent properties. In the case of FTR, uh, infrared spectroscopy, uh, uh, below uh, 1000, we observe the, the presence of the vibrations of uh, the metals and, and oxygen, of calcium and oxygen, zinc and iron to, to oxygen. Uh, around 306, uh, 3600, we observe uh, some kind of uh, water. And the other vibration are associated to the presence of a small amount of carbonate or uh, carbon dioxide presence. Uh, this is the morphology of the material. As we are forming this material by mechanical wall milling, we don't expect a, a concise or a precise morphology. We have a very heterogeneous uh, appearance and size distribution. Uh, by modeling through software, we can estimate the, the, the average of the of the particle size, uh, obtaining this uh, 33 nanometers. And by bed, we estimate the surface area. This area is close to the area that is reported for, for X shell uh, and yield uh, to be transformed into calcium oxide. So this area and this uh, particle size is uh, very good in order to increase the, the absorption of, of the material. Uh, this is the distribution of the elements in the composite. As you can see, we have a very uh, good homogeneity. And well, this is the, the, the experiments of absorption. I don't know if you remember in the case of Francisco when, we, when he presented the the experiments of, char of charcoal. Uh, once he reached the equilibrium, the, the tendency was flat. This is because it was related to his absorption process. It means that once the material is covered by the dye, the next dye is uh, covered, the, the first dye is covered, it's a multilayer process. In this case, we, we don't have a multilayer process, we have a chemisorption process. This means that uh, we have uh, like a reaction. Reaction is performing ac across the time. So the, the activated sites are covering with the time. Independently of the uh, absorbent we are using or the concentration of that we are using, we have this kind of uh, behavior. When we uh, model the results, we model to pseudo first order and pseudo second order we observe a better fit into the second cellular order, which means that we have an, in the presence of a chemisorption process. This is a, a, a way uh, in which we can uh, schematize the chemisorption process. We only have some kind of activate sites, so the dye only uh, get absorbed in these specific sites. In the, if it was a physisorption, we will observe more dye or more pollutant above the, the first dye that is absorbed in the first layer. Uh, also, we perform some uh, experiments uh, varying the temperature in order to, to, to see the thermodynamic parameters. We observe that enthalpy and entropy is, is positive, which means that we have a, a, a lot of distortion, which is related to chemical interaction which confirm the presence of chemisorption process. Uh, but also, uh, as you can see, we have a negative uh, uh, Gibbs free energy, which means that we have a spontaneous process. But also, uh, when we increase the temperature, we observe a, a better performance, which means that we have an endothermic process. So at the end, we obtain a a, mat a material which is synthesized using waste, which is uh, a sustainable uh, performance. Uh, also, this material has great performance uh, for malachite green, but also we have tested for an another uh, another dyes, like for example, uh, uh, methylene blue, but this material is better uh, uh, removed by photocatalysis. Uh, and finally, this process is mainly governed by chemisorption and the process is endothermic and spontaneous.
and well that is all for my part this is part of, of the team and the institution that are participating uh, and thank you thank you This is a shock, uh, <laughs> interesting talk. Uh, we have time for questions. Okay. Uh, I saw in maybe the first or second slash the, the absorption processes in a uh, regeneration. Could you uh, tell me something about what are the potential regeneration methods for the uh, this composite after it has been used for light absorption? In this case, it's very complicated uh, to, to make the, the recovery of the, of the material. It's more easier, um, oh, it's easier, sorry, in the process, in the materials, for example, in your charts, because as it's uh, organic material, probably it gets uh, not uh, modified. So, uh, uh, for this material, I think it's a, a little complicated because as these are metals, uh, if you apply some uh, kind of uh, voltage or, pot or potential, you can make modification of the material. So they can tend to oxidize or, or reduce. And in the case of uh, biochars or bio activated biochars, yeah, you don't get the, the reduction or, or uh, oxidation of the organic. Well, it, it's probably you can oxidize the, the material, but it still it can it can work as oxidation. But in this case, you know, okay. it, because we have an um, inorganic material, mm -hmm. okay. or probably we can induce a reaction between calcium oxide and the ferric, forming another uh, material. Or for example. Uh, splitting the ferric in the two original compounds in zinc oxide and hematite, for example. Oh. Uh -huh. Other question? Another colleague? Another question? No? Okay. Well, thanks again, Pauline. <laughs> and we have finished. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you.